Hello, good evening. Welcome to Business Life. Coming up, Bank of Ghana moves to deal with concerns of financial technology firms as it rolls out regulations to guide their operations. Framework is in place already. Our current supervisory framework for the fintechs, uh, looking at it more from a proportionality point of view, we are about approving uh, governance uh, uh, guidelines for fintechs. Also in this bulletin, government considers taxing big technology firms like Facebook on revenues earned from Ghana due to dwindling income from local mobile operators. The economy is stabilizing and resetting. I think we are moving into the space where we are getting ready to begin to consider commercials around the ECD. We will be engaging a tax consultant on the feasibility of this move. Also in this bulletin, National Pensions Regulatory Authority advised to reduce its exposure to government debt, not, to, uh, not more than 10% of its assets to safeguard pensioners' fund during a debt restructuring exercise. But given what has happened with the domestic debt exchange, I think we, there's a need to allow pensions to diversify off government portfolio. We've got details of these and many others lined up for you, including Joy Business Van right after this break. Thanks so much for your time. I am Pius Kojo Baka. And look now at our stories. The Bank of Ghana says it has taken steps to deal with concerns of financial technology firms when it comes to regulations and support. The firms in the past had complained about not giving the needed attention with regulatory support. But first, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Max Olopokwafari, said these new corporate governance regulations should deal with some of these challenges. I touched on the need for governance, risk mitigation, and compliance. Mm -hmm. So the GRC. And these are areas that, irrespective of where you are in terms of a fintech, you must spend time and resources on to develop the governance framework, mm -hmm. the risk framework, and the compliance framework. Not because regulators are interested in it, but even if you are a fintech and a regulator is not interested in it, as a fintech, you cannot scale without that. Any investor that wants to come into your space to support you will have to be attracted by a good governance framework, good risk mitigation framework, and good compliance framework. So we need to work with them in terms of engaging more, as the whole panel agreed, to create a governance framework. Should I impose the governance framework that we have for universal banks on fintechs, no. That's why the proportionality will have to be a key component in how we design the governance framework for the fintechs, the risk mitigation framework and the compliance framework to limit the burden of these uh, regulatory issues without also compromising on fast stability. So do I understand that the, the framework is being put together or has already been done already that will be rolled out or what is happening with respect to the governance issues for uh, the fintechs uh, governor? You know, this framework is in place already. Our current supervisory framework for the fintechs, uh, looking at it more from a proportionality point of view, we are about approving uh, 
governance uh, uh, guidelines for fintechs, which hasn't been rolled out, even though we are implementing it, but it hasn't been officially rolled out, and we've engaged them. So one thing I said is that we need to engage them from the crafting stage. You don't impose it on them. We sit down and we all discuss and build it together so there is ownership. So if we engage them, we are fine-tuning, reflecting their feedback. So once that is officially announced, that's what's going to guide all of us. And, and, and that's going, but we're already implementing it anyway. Will that deal with and we want to stay a while longer with Dr. Max Olopokwafari because it says the BOG has revealed that it is now close to setting a new date for full introduction of the digital version of the CD. The central bank in 2022 was forced to freeze its introduction due to challenging economic environment. But with the economy showing signs of recovery, the bank says it has made significant progress in the rollout. Let's take a listen to Dr. Max Olopokwafari once again. We actually rolled out a contained ECD environment now. And here at this summit, you can actually load the ECD. I think let me show you my copy of the ECD on a card, okay. which actually has loaded money on it, 100 Ghana CDs. Okay. And you can actually transact and buy. When you go to the Innovation Village, mm -hmm. everything that has been sold there is only uh, transacted through digital money. Mm -hmm. So you cannot use cash to buy anything there. Here, right so here. As we speak right now, uh, uh, Governor, the ECD has been operationalized. Only for this summit, as a pilot. Mm. Only for this summit here until tomorrow, you can buy at the digital village using ECD. So when will ask that when would it be rolled out? We did a bigger pilot, and when we finish the pilot, we now have to look at the commercials. It has to come with some commercials and also create an environment to roll it out. Uh, it coincided with uh, the challenges we had in 2022. That wouldn't be the right time to roll it out. Now that the economy is stabilizing and resetting, I think we are moving into the space where we are getting ready to begin to consider commercials around the ECD and properly rolling it out more universally. But just at this summit, we decided to demonstrate how it will work and allow people to be able to load either on your mobile phone or offline. Now, government is considering taxing big technology firms like Google, YouTube, and Meta on revenues earned from the country. Now, Ghana Revenue Authority is ready to engage in these firms over the introduction of these tax measures. The move has been influenced by declining revenue from all traditional tech firms. Digitalization and Communications Minister Esla Usekufu tells Joy Business this is a move by the governments in Africa and not only Ghana. The revenue that we're getting from the International Gateway is declining. And so how does government also make up for these declining revenue sources? We have to look at new ways of getting uh, some of the profits that are being made in this sector. And that's why I mentioned on the panel that we need to have that conversation with Big Tech. Mm. They are using the infrastructure put in by the network operators without contributing to the development of that infrastructure. So once you extend connectivity, they ride on it to pro provide their services, all these huge social media platforms. They don't help roll out the fiber or radio networks that enable them to deliver, that enables you to check your Facebook or account or to even to use WhatsApp. None of them contribute to the, or Google or, or all the others. None of them contribute to actually building the networks on which they deliver their services to the end consumer. Is that situation going to be allowed to continue? No. At some stage, they're going to be asked to also contribute. So I'm glad GRE has already started um, having those conversations with them. And it is a global... Taxing them more, paying more. They are not paying any taxes at all. No. No taxes at all on the revenue that they are earning from um, their, their subscribers in Ghana. So That's the YouTubes and the rest. All of them. I say all these social media... So you're going after them. I'm not going after them. GRA is going after It's them. not GRA alone that is going after them. Globally, we're having those conversations. You know, there are lots of these influencers, this, that, 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 who are earning significant amounts of revenue from utilizing these platforms. 
how does and that's profits that you're earning from doing business in Ghana on a global network which isn't contributing anything to the the economy of Ghana so I'm not saying that we should be looking into that space globally those conversations have been going on within the ranks of the ITU Smart Africa Alliance you name it and so at some stage and I think it's better we have this conversation as a group instead of as individual countries and I'm pretty sure you want to understand all of these. Let's get in um, and speak to tax consultant Francis Timoboy to help us understand this um, latest move by government. And Francis, I'm grateful you could join me on Business Life. I want to know how feasible is this move? Or would you say it's long overdue? you? First, um, it is feasible. The only problem is that there are a number of considerations that is to begin. I don't know whether you can hear me. Yes, I can. Yes, so there are a number of considerations that need to be given to this. Um, in 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 in, in this, this discussion didn't start today. It's, it's been on the table for a very long time, and so taxing the uh, tax giants has been, uh, in fact, it, it, it has even resulted in a dispute between United States and France. So, if you say it is visible, yes, it is. The, the only problem is that. We have a number of hurdles to cross before we can say we are budgeting for any revenue from such taxation. And, and I'm curious, what are these hurdles you, you are likely to meet? So there are huge international cooperation that are needed. Um, I was using France and U.S., for example. In July 2020, France decided to tax U.S. tech giants, Facebook, YouTube, and all those stuff. In retaliation, United States said that this was a targeted tax in order to, you know, destroy United States um, companies by France. So U.S. also said that all luxury goods that are coming from France is going to raise tariffs to the tune of over $1.3 billion. And the question is, how was it resolved? Both of them said, okay, then they're going to suspend the digital service tax. If you suspend the digital service tax, then U.S. is also going to suspend the, the, the tariffs that are goes on France uh, products. So clearly, you need international cooperation. And you know why? They suspended it because they thought that this goes beyond two countries. And therefore, they need to do a lot of engagement and they needed multilateral agreement to be able to de deal with it. So Ghana alone cannot just get up and say we are taxing it. I mean, there will be repercussions for us. The second issue is, apart from the, the international consideration and cooperation that we need to we need to cross. We need some very strong legal and technical capacity to be able to identify these revenues. Otherwise, we'll pass the law and then we won't be able to tax it. It has been on the table for a very long time. Even big, big uh, economies, they've tried it and it's not been easy. But trust me, it is the way businesses are operating now. And therefore, if we're able to align and be able to tax this uh, sector, Called the digital economy. We're going to make a lot of money. Today, you can buy everything online. You can, we used to buy music through the CDs. Today, it is no more. So if you are, your tax law is still waiting for CDs to be imported, you are out. And for me, taxation of the digital and uh, digital economy and digital services is the way to go. The only problem is that it is too complex and it requires a number of cooperation uh, from other countries. And I don't know where we are uh, when, we, when it comes to this bill currently um, lying on the table in terms of how it should be implemented. But again, this is um, an innovative way to generate revenue. Can you tell us um, its impact on revenue mobilization, basically? So, so Pius, it will have a very significant impact on revenue mobilization. Everybody is now doing digital online platforms, uh, marketplaces, uh, the juniors, and there are many. And almost everything that we need now is online. So it has a huge revenue uh, potential. Now we have the draft legislation. But like I said, if Ghana alone decides to have its law drafted, uh, it, won't, it won't get anywhere. And Pius, let's distinguish this particular tax that we are talking about from the VAT on digital service. That VAT is on consumers. So today, if you're advertising on Facebook, 
there's that likelihood that Facebook will add a VAT. That one is paid by the consumer. What we are talking about here is their profit, their income. And if you look at the draft bill that we have done, we even have to ascertain the global uh, revenue of the, the company. So Facebook, you need to determine the global revenue, which is located in the United States. So we need a lot of technical capabilities to be able to do this. And a lot of cooperation is needed. But if you ask me, it, it has a huge revenue potential. If we're able to cross the challenges, it will add a huge amount of money to our tax revenue. So it's not anything likely to happen anytime soon, right? Until we cross that hurdles. I, I, I don't, don't foresee this thing happening. Look, the discussion on digital economy started somewhere in 2013 uh, with the OECD. And he, large, large economies are even still struggling to deal with this one. So I don't foresee it happening now. I think that what we have started is a VAT on the digital service. That one has already taken place. So that one, we are collecting it. But when it comes to the profit base, the income, we are going to see some time pass before we, we, we start estimating the revenue from that, that place. We may start it. But I, I don't think that we're going to raise any significant amount of money until we, we, we buy into this multilateral agreement and then the international cooperation. Thank you so much, Francis Timoboy, tax consultant, for your time here on Business Life. We really appreciate it. You're still watching Business Life. You're pausing for a breather. Be right back with the Joy Business Fund. Quickly before we go, economist Professor Godfrey Popkin has advised the National Pensions Regulatory Authority to reduce its exposure to government debt by limiting its exposure to not more than 10% of its assets. We can take a listen to him. Highly regulated in terms of how they do their investment. And, and if you look at the, the proportions and the way the law has been structured, actually uh, it's very hard to be innovative. It's very hard to be innovative within the pension sector. For instance, there's a cap of 5% of what they can put here in government instruments and the rest of them. The idea is that given what has happened with the domestic debt exchange, I think we, there's a need to allow pensions to diversify off government portfolio. Because even if you look at almost all the other investment they do, they end up with a certain port where the government is still the dominant off taker and all of that. And it's not helpful. And that is why we are making specific recommendations about increasing the cap from 5% to 10%. And then also, beyond that, we're also looking at how they can explore uh, foreign investments as a way of diversifying. And the rest, of course, you know the corporate trustees will also raise issues about the impact on the foreign exchange and all of that. But then again, critically, because pensions have patient capital, long-term capital, we are looking at how do we structure with the right legislative framework, enable pensions working with other subsectors to syndicate big ticket transactions that can critically close the infrastructure gap. Because the reality is that government alone cannot be the face of infrastructure drive. Thank you so much for being part of the bulletin. I am Pius Kojubaka. For more stories, do log on to myjoyonline.com. See you same time tomorrow. Bye bye.